Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Hey, I want you to go ahead and grab your Bible. I hope you have it with you. And you can turn to 1 Timothy. Again, what a great day. And uh, what a great way to, way to start the week. Just singing to the Lord. And You know, some songs we sing, I was, I was over there just thinking some songs are really aspirational. We want them to be true of us. My wealth is in the cross. I don't need anything else. I mean, that's enough. And that's really where this message is heading today. And I want to be real clear um, I, it's not, this message is not about anything I want from you as a pastor. Uh, it's what I want for you. I want you to be set free. And, uh, my prayer has been that God would speak into your heart today in great ways. So the next three weeks, we're going to look, be looking at this passage. It's out of first Timothy. In fact, you can go ahead and turn to first Timothy chapter six. All right. I'm going to put this into context a little bit. Paul is speaking uh, to the early church. And I know that a lot of us, if you're like me, for years, I've always thought that, you know, you watch a movie or some film about the early church or about the life of Jesus, and you see people walking around in robes, and they're living in these little huts or something, or uh, houses. And I often think that the early church really is made up a bunch of Bedouins, probably poor uh, people who didn't have much. And and Jesus talked a lot about the poor, and, and he was like a magnet to the poor. But you know, when you look at church history, you may not know this. The church, the early church, flourished among the wealthy. In fact, the church in Ephesus, where, we, where, where Timothy finds himself, Paul is writing to Timothy, his young, uh, his young pastor. He's mentoring this young pastor, and he's telling him, here's how I want you to guide and teach people. And in this section here, he's going to say, listen, and among the wealthy, because there's a lot of them in Ephesus, here's what I want you to say. And so today, this passage really is much for me as a pastor, shepherd, leader, as it is for us. So he's telling me, he's telling us, here's what I want you to say to rich people. All right. And so we're going to spend the next three weeks on how to be rich. And my premise here is that uh, I, it may surprise you. I want everybody in here to be rich. Somebody say amen. Everybody in here to be rich, but I want you to be good at it because most rich people aren't good at it. And if you're not good at it, your wealth will destroy you. Your heart will shrivel up. Your hope will drift from God to your stuff and you'll spend your life anxious and worried about your stuff until the day you die. And I can't tell you how much I want you to get this for you, for your sake for our sake, as the people of God. And I believe God's put us in a unique place uh, here, right here in North Dallas, one of the wealthiest spots on the planet to show the world what it is, to not hold tightly to our stuff, but to release it to him. And so, you know, the, the early Christians, it, the, the early, early church spread among the wealthy and yes, among the poor, but they, it wasn't their theology. You know, most people, the, the Jews, in fact, believe that their theology was crazy. It wasn't their crazy theology that drew people uh, to them. It was their crazy, overflowing generosity that drew people. It was, it was the wealthy Christians who cared for the poor. It, was, it were the believers who gave away to those who did not have enough. And as a result, they saw the love of Christ in them, that he first loved them, that he gave his life for them, and they then have given their lives to others. So look at this passage right here, First. Timothy chapter 6. We'll have it on the screen as well. Hope you brought your Bible. Look at this. As for the rich in this present age. So immediately Paul's saying, you know, we're talking about now. So it's implied there's another age. So there's a future age. He's going to reference that as well. In this present age, those who are rich, charge them not to be haughty in the ESV, arrogant, not, not to be prideful, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But on God, who richly provides with everything to enjoy. He richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They're to do good, to be rich in good works, 
to be generous and willing to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. That word life is zoe in the Greek, real life. All right, so for the next three weeks, we're going to look at this, these three verses. And we're going to kind of break it down. You can't really separate it so much, though we are going to do that a bit. It's one sentence in the Greek, by the way. So today even, I'm going to kind of walk us through the whole thing. But here's how we're going to break it down a bit. And you'll see, you can find, I, I didn't bring my keys up here, but I have a little, on your keychain, you'll be able to put... Um, a, a little piece that will remind you, just stick it on there like you have your little card from the grocery store or whatever else on your keychain. We have a card that we want you to get. It's small, fits in your pocket, and it says to be rich. And it breaks it down this way. It'll say it on here. It's a little green card, and it says um, be rich in good works. All right, this is what Paul says, to be generous and to be willing to share. And we want this to be a reminder for you all the time throughout your days to be generous with your time, to be generous with others in the way that you spend your time, how you, uh, how you interact with people in the days to come. Now, immediately, some of you are here, and particularly guests, I think, if you're a first timer here or you haven't been here in a while, uh, there you go. You're going to grab those. I think they're out and about on your way, way out. Make sure you get one, every person. We have enough for, for all of us here. Okay, so get one of those. But some of you are probably thinking, okay, here we go. Uh, preacher talking about money. Why do preachers always talk about money? Now, if, you know, if you're a, a member here, you know, well, we don't always talk about money. But listen, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why preachers talk about money. Uh, because Jesus talked about money. That's why. You see, the scriptures tell us that, the, and here's why Jesus talked about money. Because the primary competitor for your heart is your stuff. It's your money. And so when we look in scripture, it's really interesting that what we find is 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus taught in the New Testament are about money and possessions. We find that uh, an amazing, in the Gospels, one out of 10 verses, 20, uh, no, 288 of them in all, are about money and possession, explicitly about money and possessions. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, but over 2,000 verses on possessions and your stuff. And again, why is that? See, the better question is, why did Jesus talk about money and possessions so much? Not so much, why do preachers? Now, some, yes, some preachers go the way of this health and wealth, prosperity kind of gospel. If you do this, God will bless you. And then we're not going to go there. What we're talking about is a different kind of rich, as you'll discover here. You would expect that. But the number one competitor for your heart is your money and your stuff. And so that's why Jesus talked about it so much. And that's why we're going to talk about it. So it's not what I want from you. I want you to hear that. This is, as your pastor, it's, I'm desperate for what I want for you. I want you to be set free to worship the Lord with all you've got, with all your heart. And so that's what this message really is all about. I had a guy tell me once, he said he left, he was talking about a church he formerly had been in. And uh, he said, I left the church because I didn't agree with something the pastor said. I almost started laughing. I couldn't. I mean, you don't do that. But I thought, really? Because check it out. Now I get it. There's core theology and all those things. But what I would want to say is, hey, um, if you agree 100% with what your pastor's saying, that's when you need to leave. I mean, he's not helping you a whole lot. And so today, as I preach this message, it's really hard to talk about our stuff. I mean, it's hard to talk because it's got such a grip on us. And so today, I want to challenge you to come before God with an open heart. And, and my role really is to challenge you. I hope you don't agree with all that I say. Because that means your heart needs to listen and say, okay, what does this mean? And how is this spirit speaking into my heart? So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how to be rich. What do you say? Okay. Most rich people, again, aren't too good at it. Now, some of you are here today and you're going, I, 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 like to, I would try. I'd like to try. I, I could give it a shot. You know, I'd like to try to be rich. See, what happens is most rich people lose themselves on the way to becoming rich. As we'll talk about today, there's a point at which, and I don't know what the amount is, but there's a point somewhere along the way where your hope starts to shift from God to your stuff. And that's what scripture tells us. That's what Jesus talks about. Jesus, in fact, said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Now he's using hyperbole, but he's making a point. 
nearly impossible. It is what he's saying. For those of us who are wealthy to truly stay on track and to live for the kingdom of God. Now, here's what happens. See, I want to ask the question, why is it? And I've traveled all over the world. I've seen people, believers in the slums of, of India. I have seen people in, in, in the, the most, uh, most uh, poor, you know, abject poverty that, that you can ever see on the planet in places in Africa. Many of you have been to South America. I've been to the Middle East. I've been all over the world. I have seen the poorest people on the planet. Why is it that the poorest believers that I have seen around the globe are more joyful, more content than, frankly, most anybody I know in North Dallas? Why is it that every time we come from these places, we say, oh my gosh, they're so joyful, they're praising God. Why is it that we're not that way? And you start to realize the many gifts we've been given materially and all the financial wealth that we have and all the things God's given us, uh, we start to realize maybe it's not a blessing after all. It can be, and that's what this is about. But for many of us, it's, it's a curse. Listen, if you have uh, a median household income of $50,000 a year, here's what happens. Research tells us, shows us that, that you give about 6% of your income away. People who make $200,000 a year, they give about 4% away. And that number of percentage of giving, uh, it, it gets smaller as people make more and more money. See, a lot of us think, man, if I just had more money, I'd give more. That's not the trend. The more we have, the less we give. So let's talk about how to be rich. The first thing I want you to see, I'm going to give you five points here. If you take notes on sermons, I want you to write this down. And I'm telling you, young people and some of you young parents who are here, some of you dedicated children today, or maybe you're brand new married, maybe you're a young single adult, you've got to get this right. Now's the time. It's, you're you're going to waste your life. And so I want you to write these things down. First of all, you can't be rich until you know you are. You can't be rich until you know that you're already rich. This is the first hurdle. Paul says, listen, command. He's telling Timothy, he's telling me as a pastor. He's not offering helpful hints. He's saying, command these people. Command the rich to do these things. Because it'll set you free. The first hurdle we have as rich people is this. Rich people live in denial. Rich people don't know they're rich. See, all of us here, we know somebody who's rich. I'm not rich, but I know somebody who is. All of us are in that position. Because wealth becomes a relative thing. Listen, Gallup Poll asked people who make 15000 a year uh, what, it, what, what it would be for them to feel like they're rich, like they had enough. They said $35,000 a year. People who made $35,000 a year, they asked them, how much would be enough when you would feel like you're rich? They said $75,000 a year. And that number just keeps going up. What is up with that? You see, as we'll discover today, it's the fact that, that more will never be enough. Money Magazine asked their subscribers, how, at what point would you feel that you're wealthy? At what point would you say you're rich? Subscribers to Money Magazine, you know what they said? Five million dollars. Might be rich at that point. You see, it's all relative. And so Paul says, I want to charge you. This word instruct, charge, command. It's translated, it's a military term. I want you to charge them with this. Paul is, it again, dispensing helpful hints here. He's saying this is the command of God. So let the Spirit of God speak to you. First of all, and this is my point, really, we're all rich, all right? So I'm speaking to the right crowd, and I want to challenge you to be rich. Secondly, you can't be rich until you know where your wealth comes from. You can't be rich. In verse 17, he says that all that we have comes from him. Now, notice the first command. Look at this. He says, the first thing I want you to do, command them not to be haughty, not to be arrogant. Why is that his first command? How does he know? Because most of the time, you know. When you meet a wealthy person, most of the time, that's it. You see they're haughty. You see they're wealthy. You know why? Because wealth brings pride. Wealth brings along with it pride. Why is this his first command? Because he's saying arrogance always follows wealth. He says, command them not to be that way. The word really is conceited. Here's what happens for wealthy people. Wealthy people, because they have wealth, and because we measure so much of our worth, right, literally, 
even our personal worth by what we have, we tend to think, I am wealthy because I'm smart. I mean, I made some good choices along the way. I'm smart. I'm smarter than most people. You see, this is how it plays out. All of us are prideful, but wealthy people are especially prideful. You know, I, I worked hard. That's why I'm wealthy. I went to the right school. I chose the right things. I made some good choices along the way. I am the reason that I'm wealthy is where that goes. And so we become prideful. We often say, don't we say this about people? Hey, that guy's really wealthy, but you would never know it. Why do we say that? Most of the time you know it. <laughs> right? That's why we say that. Guy's really wealthy, but you'd never know he is. Because pride follows wealth. Paul says to Timothy, tell them not to be arrogant with what they have. Don't be arrogant. Don't think you're better than other people simply because you have more money. I'm telling you, I've been out into the bush of India, out in the middle of nowhere, where I have met pastors who started churches. There's this, this multiplying movement of disciple making taking place in places like China. We're a part of it in India, places like, places, places like Bangladesh. And I'm telling you, I have met you know, this, uh, a pastor out in front of this hut without a shirt on. And I've left these people thinking, that man's one of the greatest in the kingdom. Right there. He's one of the greatest men in the kingdom of God. And he has nothing. Because God measures these things differently. And he says, listen, don't be arrogant simply because you have much. He challenges us with that. There's a verse in Proverbs, look at it, 1811. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. What's he saying here? He's saying that rich people think they're going to kind of save their way to security. They're going to uh, accumulate their way to safety. I could say it this way. They're going to acquire their way to salvation. And it's all in the mind. His wealth becomes a strong city. It's, it's all in his imagination. They are proud of it. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul says this. What do you have that you, did, that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? He's saying you, everything you have was given to you. How can you claim that you have anything? God owns all things and he's given it to you. If all you have is a gift, why and how can you take credit for it? Right? Look okay, at number three. You can't be rich until your hope is in God. This is what he's saying. A crazy thing happens, friends. Listen, when you start to accumulate things for yourself, as your income increases, your hope will, will, will begin to migrate. As your income increases, your hope will start to drift. It'll start to move away from God and to your stuff. This is why Jesus talks so much about wealth and the things of this world. You begin to imagine a certain amount of money that can protect you and everyone around you. And the older you get, think, man, I got to take care of my children. I got to take care of my grandchildren. And there's this constant, uh, always never ending challenge. See, riches are uncertain, he says. Don't put your trust in, in things that are uncertain because they pertain to the things of this world, to this present age. That's what he's saying. They tend to uh, just draw us in, in verse, in verse 17, this present world. All the money in the world will be worthless someday. I've said it recently. You think about what is Steve Jobs' net worth right now? Zero. It's zero. What's, you know, Rockefellers, whoever, name the person. It's zero. And, 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 and what, we, what we do, we constantly think that, man, if I just had more. In Proverbs eleven four, 4, it says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. He's saying there's a day coming. The Bible says there's coming a day where for every man, we're destined to die once, every person, and then face judgment. And it's not gonna, your money's not going to come on the scale. It's not going to come into play. And so I just want to challenge you, as you give yourself to the Lord, this becomes a lifestyle, really, of, uh, of generosity. 
And so what we want to talk about in these days is not just giving your money. What I've discovered is that people who, are, who give their time, uh, they also give their resources. People who tend to give more money, they also give their time. It's a, it's a comprehensive lifestyle of generosity. Why? Because their hearts are not set on the things they have. And so one of the things we're going to do throughout this series, we're going to talk about people who are actually spending time and their resource and their energy. They're going to give it over uh, to the Lord. And so I think, are we here in the room? Do you know, Justin, are we here? Is RJ in here? Not yet. I'm going to keep pressing on. All right. Um, hey, look at number four. We, no, no worries. We'll jump in. We're going we're gonna to talk to uh, Jana Gardner, is some of you who know Jana, who spends her time serving the Lord. Look at number four. You can't be rich until you're content. All right? So first, you can't be rich till you know it. You can't be rich until you know where your wealth comes from. You can't be rich until your hope is in God. Fourthly, you can't be rich until you're content. All right? Until you're satisfied. The more a person has, the more a person wants. You know, here's what happens. Um, we, don't, we don't just buy things anymore. We tend to upgrade things. Now, because nobody in here is rich, I just want to tell you up front, okay, in case you get rich, I want to warn you, okay, because I really do want you to become rich. So some of you might become rich. And when you get there, I want you to remember this. Um, here's what rich people do. Rich people do some crazy stuff. I've heard about this. Uh, rich people, they'll go into like they have a house and they go into their kitchen uh, and they have like a microwave, they have a refrigerator, they have an oven, and they have this countertop, really nice, maybe tile countertop. And they go in, listen to this, I'm telling you, I've heard about this. Rich people go in, they'll strip all of that out. Like they'll tear it out. And then what they do, they'll replace it, they'll upgrade it. They'll put it in a refrigerator, they'll put it in a microwave, they'll put it in an oven, and they'll get like the maybe marble countertop, like a nicer tile. Rich people do this. I know that sounds crazy. I'm telling you, they do this. I know rich people. Listen, I've heard of this. They go to the Apple store. They'll stand in line for like an hour. And a friend will call them and, and say, hey, what's up? What are you doing? Yeah, hey, yo, I'm standing in line at the Apple store. Been here like an hour. I'm like, wait, how'd you take my call? I'm on my phone. Your iPhone? Yeah, I got my, yeah, my iPhone. And you're standing in line to get another iPhone. Okay, rich people do that. I'm just telling you. It's crazy stuff. They got to get the next best thing. I know, listen, there are rich people who have a house. And they have a room for every person in the house. And they sell the house. I'm not lying. They'll sell the house and go buy another house with more rooms in the house. Some people add on to their house. The one they have. Some people have a house. Listen, I'm just in case you get rich, I'm just telling you. Some people have a house for their cars. <laughs> they have a, I'm telling you. Some people have a house, a room big enough for like both of their cars. I'm just, in case you get rich, just watch for it. I'm telling you, don't do this. This is what people do. Rich people, I read about this. I saw it on TV. That rich people do this crazy kind of stuff. Now, here's what we do. Listen, I want to I give this secret too, to you, all right? Because we all know somebody who's rich. None of us are rich. But we all know somebody who is. And I want you to help them because what you don't know about them is they are plagued with discontent. Rich people are plagued with discontent. And here's why. When you feed an appetite, it grows. You know, you know satisfying an appetite does not diminish it. When you... It expands it. To diminish an appetite, you have to starve it. And so what happens is, see, I've known rich people. Again, they, they, I've known, listen, this is crazy. I know rich women who will go stand in front of their closet. They have workout clothes. They have casual clothes. They have nice clothes. They have dresses. They got, they got like, like, like shoes, <laughs> lots of shoes. Like casual shoes, they got, you know, they have all kinds of shoes. And they'll stand there. I read about this. They, they will stand there and they'll say, I have nothing to wear. Y'all have heard this. I have nothing to wear. I heard about that. I've actually heard that these same, some of these same parents, they have like daughters 
And they have, I'm not lying, they have like 10, 15 pairs of shoes for the kids. Two feet. 12, 15 pairs of shoes. I'm just telling you, rich people are never quite content. And nobody thinks they're rich. We know somebody who is. But all of us are rich. And friends, listen, don't get caught in it. How much would it take? Here's my point. How much would it take for you to feel like you have enough? I want you to think about that for a minute. I mean, for real, like where you are, like, okay, if I had this much money, whatever your net worth might be, how much would you say that would be enough for me? I know what the answer is because I'm kind of, I'm kind of this way. I know what your answer is. Here's the question. How much is enough? Here it is. More. More than you currently have. And that will always be the answer. Your hope has shifted from God who is enough to what will never be enough. Because money and your stuff was never designed to fill this hole in you that only God can fill. And friends, many of us are chasing after it. Your hope has shifted. And here's what I want you to hear. More will never be enough. More will never be enough. So listen, there's no magic number out there. There's no magic number. And so it's why Paul says in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13, he says, listen, I've learned to be content. I've had a lot. I've had almost nothing. I've been in prison. I have, I've been in poverty, and I'm content in every circumstance. That is a rich man. That's a man who's rich, all right? So here's what I want us to do. I told you earlier. Uh, RJ's going to come up. And he's going to talk to Jana Gardner, a friend of ours, woman I love and respect so much. He's going to come and talk to her about how she has decided she's going to spend a little bit of her time and give away a bit that God has given to her. So come on up here, RJ. Jana, we're glad you're here. Let's give, uh, give her a hand. The two of them, come on up. Talk to us. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right, well, thanks. This is fantastic uh, to be a part of this series. Because my job is I get to work with the best people uh, in the city. Jana is one of our own. She goes to church here. Uh, she's part of our family, but she's also one of our partners that we have. She is the president and CEO of Healing Hands Clinics. How many of you know about Healing Hands? See, we've got volunteers. Oh. Here. You like that? Oh, that just warms my heart. They really, really like you. That's the good thing. Oh, wow. Um, that it was born out of her volunteering one time. And she was a nurse and said they need a clinic over here. Um, 8,000 patients uh, are what she has on her active role over there. 8,000 patients in this clinic. Um, since the new clinic opened up, debt-free, uh, over in Vickery, they've had 1,169 patients come through since January. Uh, excuse me, since July. They have 45 full-time staff. They do medical uh, services, they do uh, dental services, and they do counseling services there. So give her a hand one more time uh, for her. She's one of the hardest working people that I know. Let me ask you as we start this, um, what does it mean for Park City to support you? Well, to have a family of faith that loves Jesus and allows us to be able to share the compassion of Jesus and be the hands and feet every day is amazing. I know many of you pray for us, many of you serve us, and they serve our patients. And so to be able to know that we have the support of such a God-fearing church is really important to my team because we've intentionally hired believers to be able to share the gospel through compassion ministry so we can provide hope for the spirit and healing for the body. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about you is when I go there, um, you call everybody by name. Uh, normally when we help people, we just see them as people, but Jana sees them as individuals. And I go through there and they're calling people by name and they're loving on them. Uh, you can see somebody that's not from this country is nervous about doctors, nurses, and what's going to happen to them. And I watch her just calm them down by calling them by name. Is there, is there a story that you could share with us of a person by name that you've seen a difference in, even just in the last couple of weeks? Sure. Well, I'm going to change the name just for confidentiality, but we have a patient named Candace, and Candace came to us and was really physically debilitated um, from some 
several illnesses. Um, she's only 48 years old. She couldn't walk on her own. She was using a wheelchair, and that was very overwhelming and daunting to me personally because someone that's that age should be in the prime of their life. She began to get medical care from Dr. Barry, and then she started coming to Community Cafe, and um, the gospel was shared with her, and um, Salvador Rivas is a member of our church, and um, he's our chaplain, and we actually baptized her last Sunday, and, and it was awesome. Right, so that's the first baptism to come out of that community cafe. Uh, community cafe is something that meets on Tuesdays. And Thursdays. Thursdays. Right? Meets in the afternoon. Uh, Terry Hurd, another one of our members here, puts out all kinds of food. And Terry, I, I'd say, I hope she's not here. Yeah, I love her to death. She kind of wakes up with her hair done. You know, it's kind of, she's like perfect all the time. And so when she does a spread, it's all perfect, little melon balls. And so I would have thrown out some crackers on the trail. Like, there you guys go. The only time that some of these people get to be without their children is when they go to the doctor. And then some of them hear bad news. And so the community cafe provides a time for them to go in there among caring people, eat something, relax a little bit without their kids, talk about their problems. And since that's been going on a year and a half, over 100 people have individually been led to Christ. That should make you clap, by the way. That's fantastic. And as a result of that, some of those have asked to be, to be baptized. So that's great. Um, this is your church family. You go here. We see you all the time. Uh, it's great to have a partner that's also a member of our church. And you get our support, both in how we pray for you and then with money and then with also volunteers. If I were to give you just a minute to say thanks to your family or you wanted to say something to your family, I'm just going to give you free reign for about a minute to say whatever you want to well, minutes, probably not long enough, but I'm going to honor RJ in that and, and Jeff. Um, it is incredibly humbling um, to be a member of this church. The reason we came almost 12 years ago was because of the children's and youth programs for our children. But what we didn't realize is that God really wanted us here to be fed by the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, really God's burdened my family's heart, my husband Brent and I's heart, um, to really make sure that these almost 10,000 people that um, have been entrusted us by the Lord, that we understand what their eternal destiny is. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what it's all about. We can provide healing and through medical and dental care and, and purging of the soul through counseling. But if we don't share the compassion of Jesus, when I meet the Lord, you know, all I want is to see my honored guests that come every day to the clinic because they're going to be there and they're going to be the Lord's honored guest. And then I just want him to say for my team, good and faithful servants. Yeah. And what I'm looking forward to too is that you, uh, you'll remember their names and be inter Amen. able to introduce them to Jesus as somebody you care for. So Amen. one more time, a hand for Jenna. Thank hey, you. I want to pray. I want to pray over you. Okay. That's so good. I want to pray over Jana. Let's all pray together. Okay. Lord, I thank you so much for Jana. I praise you, God. Thank you for her great love for every person that comes into Healing Hands, into their clinic. And Lord, you know their names. You know every name. Mm -hmm. And you love them. So many who've come from around the world mm -hmm. into the Vickery area. And God, they've come here scared. They don't know you. They wonder what's next. And we get to come around them and love them. Thank you, God. For Jana, I pray you would inspire each of us and every person here. We have a place to serve. Mm -hmm. We can serve you and, and some at Healing Hands. Maybe it's another ministry. Maybe it's a walk across the street. Maybe it's a walk across the room. Let us be your hands and feet. Let us be generous with our time and our energies, willing, ready to share. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much for coming up. Isn't that a great story? We want you to, we want you to know that, uh, yeah, a life of generosity is what God's calling us to. Let's get back. We're going to land this. I've got one last point I want to make. We just said that uh, more will never be enough. And here's what Paul's saying. The fifth point I want you to see and final. You can't be rich until Jesus is enough. You can't be rich until you have this superior satisfaction that you found in him. So I know that you're sitting here. It's why you came today. You didn't just come to sing songs or just kind of hear me talk. You came because you want to live differently. You want to be set free from the struggles and the anxieties of this world. How can I take hold of that which is truly life? Anybody want a little bit of that, right? How many of us want a lot of that? That's why you're here today. It's by discovering that Jesus is enough. And Jesus said this, Jesus said, give me, give me your treasure. 
because I know your heart will follow. Give me what you, what you long for the most. It's why he said you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and your money. So here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you with, with this question. How do you know if wealth has become your God? How do you know? And this may sound like radical language to say, a God? I don't think so. It's become an idol. How do you know? Well, there's two ways. And I'm going to close with this. I want to, I want to frame this with two questions because there's two ways you can know. One is uh, implicit or less explicit. You have to dig deeper to understand it. The next is very explicit. And in fact, it's in this text right here. The first one is this. I'm going to, I'm going to frame it with two questions. The first is, where is your treasure? I want you to think about that. What do you treasure? And what, it, what I mean there is, what do you cherish? What's what Jesus says. What do you value? Where do you place your hope? What do you adore? Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever you value, more, more, uh, more clearly, I guess, is, is you know, how would you know? Uh, where does your heart run? Because your heart points you to your treasure. What do you get excited about? What do you think about? Uh, what, what are your, and we've said it often, your deepest emotions will point you to your idols. What are you anxious about? Many of us are anxious about money. What are you passionate about? See, what, are your, what do you think about the most? It can be good or bad. Wherever your hope lies, that's your God. Wherever your energies run, that's your functional God. And so Jesus says, Give me your treasure because I know your heart's going to follow. And so that kind of leads us to this next question. Are you a giver? Are you a giver? That's the explicit test. If you're a giver, if you're generous with what you have, then it's the undeniable test. If you give faithfully, then, you, uh, then your, your wealth doesn't have this grip on you. And if you're like Stacy and I, always constantly trying to grow in our giving, you should have a process of growth in giving. And I'm so grateful. I want to challenge you from early on that you give 10% of your income. I think, it's, I think that's the training wheels of giving. That's the standard of giving. And if you keep that, listen, here's how you, here's how you war against your wealth increasing and percentage of giving dropping is by determining I've got a percentage I'm going to give. I don't care how much money I'm making. And I know others who said, I'm going to, I'm going to cap my, my standard of living so that I can give more and more as, I, as my income rises. And many of us should go that way because God has given us so much. That should be the challenge for many of you today, that you would increase your standard of giving as God increases your standard of living, right? So listen, friends, I said it early on. It's time to get this right. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Listen, if you're, if, you're, if you're running after the things of this world and, and, and you're a young, young single person or young married person, get it right now or you'll spend the rest of your life chasing it. And you'll teach your kids by default, you'll teach them how to chase it as well. And they'll never be satisfied. And they'll be unhappy. And you may be the wealthiest person on your block, but you'll be completely unhappy because wealth will never satisfy don't put your hope in the things God provides. Put your hope in the God who provides all things. And we do all of this, and I'm going to close with this. We do it because Christ himself has given his life for us. I'm going to close our time in prayer, but I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Then you might be rich in all the ways that really matter. So let's close our eyes and just bow our heads. And I'm going to close our time together in prayer. And then we've got some announcements and such before we go. But would you just uh, yeah, bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to ask you, what has God been saying you, to you today? From his word, what is he saying? And what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because it's in our obedience. It's when we obey that the power of God shows up in our lives. Here's the thing about the truth of God. 
You don't fully grasp it and understand it until you obey it. You don't fully experience the truth and the joy of obedience until you obey Him. So I want you to just, while you're sitting there, I want you to put your palms up. Uh, Again, just put your palms up on your lap there. Be reminded, friend, you came into this world with nothing. And you'll leave this world with nothing. The Word of God tells us, be rich. For His glory, to His glory, and for your good. Be rich in love and good deeds. Be rich in generosity. Be rich. Be willing to share. Lord God, I pray that we'd get this right. I pray you'd set us free. It starts as we recognize, we realize that you are enough for us. All the love we need, we have found in you. We don't need more. Let us be generous givers. Thank you, God, that we have a church that we can give directly to the ministries of this church. And it goes to places like Healing Hands. And it goes to serve the poor. It goes to help people come to Christ right here on our campus and beyond and all around the world. Only you can do that. Take money and turn it into transformed lives. So we thank you, God. Let us be generous as we give to you through our great church. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We surrender our lives to you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.